House Republican Caucus is trying to do in the Policy Committee regarding strengthening the working class, trying to find out what we can do better as a commonwealth to assist employers uh, to generate greater jobs, more jobs, and try to keep government as a partner, not as a deterrent in that goal. Uh, before we start, I'm going to turn the microphone over to our host member, Jason Ortitai. Jason, we're very gracious that you are kind enough to have us here today and look forward to today's event. Um, thanks, Kerry. I'm happy to be here. Um, although this is not my district, I think I probably am the closest out of anyone here, um, representing Southern Allegheny County and, and parts of Northern Washington County as well. It, it was funny, a couple days ago, we actually had a, a really good event in South Fayette, which is in my district. We have a couple big things going on there. We have the Turnpike extension from the airport connecting 2230 to 79, which will take some traffic off of the parkway, which is always fun this time of day, as I'm sure a lot of people here can relate to. Um, but one of the big things is that we'll also connect South Point all the way up to the Shell Cracker plant site, which is going to be a huge, huge investment for my district and for Allegheny County in this part of the state. We were talking with the county executive and we were throwing around the B word, which is billions. We're looking at billions of dollars of investment coming into Southern Allegheny County. Uh, lots of new structure, lots of new buildings, lots of new jobs. Most of that a result of the energy industry, and we need to continue to help that, that industry thrive. So with that said, thank you guys for being here. Looking forward to your testimony. Before I introduce the panel, I'm going to ask my members to the left to the right to introduce themselves and where, what, where their district is in the state. Thank you. I know I heard him say right. <laughs> My name is Lee James. I represent 64th District, which is all of Venango County in, in the north, part of uh, Northeast Butler County. Good morning, Tommy Sankey, uh, 73rd District, Clearfield and Cambria Counties. Uh, good morning, thank you for coming. My name is Justin Walsh. I am state representative for the 58th Legislative District, which is southwestern portion of Westmoreland County. I'm Representative Eric Nelson, Westmoreland County. Thanks for coming today. We may have another member to come bear with us. There's a lot of things demanding time, but uh, we are very gracious that the members are here. I'm Kerry Benninghoff. I chair the House Policy Committee. I'm from Center in Mifflin counties, right in the middle of the state, and uh, home of the Penn State Dittany Lions, who hopefully will have a good day tomorrow. Uh, with that, we have a great panel to start. Starting off will be Rachel Gleason with the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance, Matt Smith, Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, one of our former colleagues, as well as David Spiegelmeyer of the Marcel Shale Coalition. Out of courtesy and honor to my mother, we will start in that order. So Rachel, if you'd like to start, we will go to the young man of your far right and the younger man to your far left. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't sure if it was left or right or if by default I go first. I just want to make sure people are on their toes this morning. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Policy Committee. Uh, Policy Committee. My name is Rachel Gleason. I'm the Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance. And just to give you some background, the uh, PA Coal Alliance represents about 80% of the bituminous operators in um, Pennsylvania. Thank you. A little over 80% of the bituminous operators in Pennsylvania, but we also represent a large portion of the manufacturer and service provider companies that service the industry. So that includes, you know, some of the pipe producers, um, the steel fabricators, the environmental consultants that rely heavily on a thriving coal industry to um, have a healthy economy for those industries. Um, we have the most plentiful type of bituminous coal in the Appalachian region. In Pennsylvania, we, uh, we produce, this year we'll be producing probably about 54 million tons of coal. By way of reference, last year we were about 46 million tons of coal. So this year we're up by about 20% for the bituminous coal production. We produce two types of bituminous coal. One is thermal coal, which is used for producing reliable baseload electricity. Um, and we also produce metallurgical coal, which is used to make the coke that makes the steel that goes to the manufacturing industry and supports a lot of jobs in Pennsylvania. Um, in western Pennsylvania, we have high volatile, medium vol, and low vol bituminous coal fields. And the quality of that coal is based on the carbon content mm -hmm. and the sulfur and the burn rate. 
Here at U.S. Steel, they use probably about 15 to 20 percent Pennsylvania coal, but the coal that they do use is the higher cost, low vol coal that comes from many of your districts, mainly in Somerset and Cambria counties. Um, that is all metallurgical coal. And in the United States, there's about 60 million tons of metallurgical coal that is produced on an annual basis. Of that, about 40 to 45 million tons is exported, so it does not stay in the United States. Of the remaining amount, about 20 million tons is used to make steel and, and support the manufacturing industry um, in our nation. But by way of reference, about 5 to 6 million tons is used just here in the Pittsburgh area. So that's about 25% of the metallurgical coal that is used in the United States is used in the Pittsburgh area. And that, again, supports our manufacturing industry. In 2014, the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance did a study with the PA Economy League of Greater Pittsburgh that indicated for every coal job, there's about 1.6 other jobs created. So the health of the coal industry is integral to manufacturing and our state and local economies. Um, and to give an example, the MET coal that is sent to U.S. Steel is trucked off load facilities to the Monongahela, barged to the Clareton, Clareton plant, creating jobs all along the way that it gets there. We have in Pennsylvania the largest mining, machinery, and equipment manufacturing industry in the country, which accounts for about 24 percent of the country's um, sector employment. And the economic impact is far-reaching when policies are implemented to make mining more difficult and costly. So when we have over-regulation of the mining industry and over-regulation of the requirements of the mining industry, the ex extraction of that coal becomes more costly, which directly impacts the price of the coal, the price to extract it, the number of jobs involved in the extraction of that coal, and the domino effect that goes to the other industries that support that coal. The National Mining Association last year released a report, a report that estimated that our coal industry contributes over 59,000 direct and indirect jobs in Pennsylvania creating nearly $6 billion dedicated to the GDP. Billion. Yes, with a B. So as you can tell, the cost of um, operating directly impacts any business in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and one of the main cost drivers for any business in Pennsylvania is your cost of electricity. So having that reliable um, base load electricity that is affordable for the ratepayer is very in important to any business model. Just over 30 percent of uh, the base load electricity in the United States comes from coal. In Pennsylvania, 80 percent of the coal that we produce is, uh, that we mine goes towards generation and coal, along with our friends in the natural gas industry, um, provide a very affordable resource um, for the manufacturing industry and for the, the ratepayers. So to keep manufacturers competitive with other facilities in other states, it's important that our cost of doing business um, re remains reasonable and um, helps our other industries remain competitive. As it relates to U.S. Steel, um, the PA coal industry helps provide affordable electricity, but we also provide coal to make coke. While some of that coke can be replaced with lower quality coal, they always need that low volatile coal that comes from our Somerset and Cambria County area. There is some in Washington and, and, and Green and uh, the Fiat region, regions, but it's more in Somerset and Cambria um, to support the manufacturing industry and the steel industry. Our coal is also sent to plants in Manesson, PA, to Warren, Ohio, to a coke plant in Alabama, um, and we have an AK coal mine that sends directly to AK Steel in Ohio. So we don't stay in Pennsylvania, but a lot of our resources go to other states and are exported internationally. Um, as far as challenges with industry, the past eight years there has been a war on coal, and I don't really care what anybody says. The increase in regulations, the increase of cost of doing business makes it difficult to extract and difficult to sell it on the market. In Pennsylvania, and I, I deal with a lot of our neighboring states in Ohio and in West Virginia and Wyoming and the Powder River Basin, we are one of the most regulated industries in Pennsylvania, if not the most regulated industry. When we submit a permit to our state DEP, it sits about as high as I do. There are 28 modules, there are piles and piles of paper, and a lot of duplicative processes. Now, our state program is very robust, and we have some operators that operate in our neighboring states like Ohio that joke that Ohio still operates in the 1970s, and we are you know, way far advanced as far as our permitting requirements. Um, we are very cognizant of the environment and want to do everything we can do to mine responsibly and make sure that any extraction is done in a responsible manner. 
However, we do have certain environmental groups that are against any use of coal altogether, and their new uh, modal operandi, if you will, is to appeal almost all of our permits or a large portion of our coal mining permits. And one of our biggest challenges right now for industry is, is those appeals and the fact that the burden of proof is not on the appellant. Anyone can appeal a permit. And that wastes our resources, that wastes state DEP's resources, and it just makes us go through legal processes that aren't necessarily necessary and um, really kind of delay any progress. So they are an issue for us. Um, in addition to that, we have a lot of duplicative oversight from our Mine Safety Health Administration on the federal level and um, OSM, which is the Office of Surface Mining, and the EPA on the federal level over the past eight years. Now, with the new administration, there has been discussion of cooperative federalism and allowing states like Pennsylvania that do have primacy over our water programs and our mining programs to operate as we have that primacy. We are the professionals in Pennsylvania. We don't try and you know, determine how you mine in Utah. We know our state and our geology. But we do have duplicative oversight, which um, can delay operations. And similarly to that, we have many regulations in Pennsylvania that are more strict than uh, federal regulations. And I'd like to thank all of you for um, the recent enactment of the uh, admin code bill that, in, that included some manganese language that would align our state mining industry with the federal standard, which will be very helpful to our operators in the long run. Um, but also in continuing to address on the regulatory front a lot of the uh, regulations that are just a hindrance to industry and often unnecessary. Um, with that said, I will say that 2017 has been a, a, an uptick in coal production in Pennsylvania. It has been a good year for us. Um, we are now third in the nation for coal production behind Wyoming and West Virginia. Uh, that doesn't mean that we've been doing excellent. It just means that there are other states that haven't been doing quite as well. So we kind of nudged out Illinois and, and, and Kentucky in our placement nationally for coal production. Um, and at, at this point, we are... Um, we are looking forward to the increased success of the metallurgical coal market and hope to maintain our placement as 30% uh, of the electricity generation for baseload electricity in the United States. And I, I can defer to either side. I think we're going this way. Age before. Yeah, look at you. Look at you. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chairman Benninghoff and, and members of the committee for um, coming to, to talk to uh, the leaders of, of various sectors and, and certainly the business community here in Western Pennsylvania today. Um, the issues that, that you're examining are, are critical, uh, not only to the Commonwealth's economic future, but specifically to the Southwestern Pennsylvania region uh, in our economic future. Uh, I'm Matt Smith. I'm president of the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, a uh, proud former member of the Pennsylvania State House. I uh, was colleagues with at least Chairman Benninghoff and uh, Representative Oberlander uh, during my time in the State House. And so I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, we, the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce is an affiliate of the Allegheny Conference uh, on Community Development, which has been um, in existence for approximately 75 years, uh, building bridges between the public sector and the private sector uh, here in southwestern Pennsylvania to drive uh, policy issues that improve our economy and quality of life. Uh, manufacturing and energy, um, as I said earlier, are absolutely critical. Uh, to our future here in Pennsylvania, in southwestern Pennsylvania. And just to give you a sense of uh, a frame of reference for how critical uh, these sectors are, uh, I want to give you a couple of statistics that weren't uh, included in my um, submitted testimony. Uh, first of all, manufacturing and energy as sectors are always in our top growth areas in southwestern Pennsylvania. Some years uh, they may be ranked, one of them may be ranked one and two, uh, some years two and three, but they are always at the top of the list. Uh, most particularly um, with manufacturing, for example, uh, the average annual wage for a manufacturing uh, employee in the Pittsburgh MSA is $59,683. That is 12.5% higher uh, than the average job in the region. Um, so we know uh, not only that manufacturing jobs have a huge multiplier effect uh, and create jobs indirectly, 
uh, but the direct jobs that are created uh, in the manufacturing sector are high paying, uh, family sustaining uh, jobs that, that we have here in our area. Uh, in the energy sector, um, just a couple of, of similar statistics. Uh, energy uh, in total, and so that would obviously include both uh, coal and natural gas, uh, made up $29 billion in gross regional product um, in the southwestern Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh MSA uh, region. Uh, in the energy sector, the average annual wage, and, and this is for 2016, uh, was $89,240. Uh, that's 71 percent higher uh, than the average job in the Pittsburgh MSA region. Uh, on the research and innovation side, energy is also providing uh, critical investment in our region. Uh, in 2016, uh, almost $21 million uh, in research, um, or 20, $21 million was in research was conducted at local universities funded by the Federal Department of Energy. Uh, 87, it, it, I think this is an important point because innovation, um, I think, is something we talk a lot about in the Pittsburgh region. And, and most of the time, uh, and, and we're very proud of this, um, it, it is associated with our robotic sector, uh, with our autonomous vehicles, artificial intelligence, all of which is great. Uh, but innovation is also occurring in manufacturing and certainly occurring in energy. And just to give you an example, uh, it, there were in 2016, there were 87 patents granted uh, in the energy sector, and that was a 30 percent increase from 2014. Uh, lastly, um, in energy, again, uh, just over $1 billion in funding um, was invested in the Bettis Atomic uh, Power Lab uh, and fossil fuel research at our Na National Energy Technology Lab, which is right down the street. Uh, from here in fiscal year 2016. So that gives you a sense of how important uh, the energy and manufacturing sectors uh, are to our local economy here in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, and, and, and we really think that uh, our region and our Commonwealth are so well positioned to take advantage of, of some of those strengths. And particularly, um, you know, if, if there is a one of the things that, that we've been advocating for is a change um, in the dialogue around um, some of the policy, um, uh, you know, not only at the local and state level, but certainly at the federal level, that, uh, that discusses more uh, about economic development and growth. Um, and we think that is absolutely critical uh, to take advantage of the resources that we have here in the region. A talented workforce, an internationally recognized university system, uh, world-class manufacturing, technology, and energy industries, um, those are just a few of the things that we believe form the foundation um, that can be used to, to provide um, uh, some um, meat to this larger growth agenda. Um, economic growth is not only essential, um, I think, for job creation, um, but when there is economic growth, uh, it makes all the other issues that we're facing, from economic issues to health care issues to economic equity issues, um, easier to solve because of the, the added revenue, the added job creation, uh, fewer demands on our, our local, state, and federal governments. All of those things come into play when you um, add economic development and growth. Uh, one key statistic that I included in my testimony, and I, I think sort of amplifies the importance of economic growth, um, is, is sort of the guiding principle, uh, is we did a study back in 2015. And it looked at uh, the past 17 years uh, of Pennsylvania's annual tax revenue. And the conclusion that our analysts um, arrived at was that uh, tax revenue consistently returned about 5.3% of Pennsylvania's total gross domestic product. Uh, through an economic boom, through a great recession, tax, rate, tax rates going up, tax rates going down, uh, new taxes being created, uh, Pennsylvania continued to collect $53 million in taxes for each $1 billion of GDP. Um, and so uh, we believe that the only solution and the most sustainable solution to solving a lot of these issues uh, is economic growth. And, and you know, we've sort of started having discussions locally around what policies uh, can drive economic growth. And, and we think there are really three areas uh, that are critical to focus on. And, and I'll highlight these that, uh, and they were included in my testimony. Uh, number one, uh, capital and infrastructure investment. Uh, programs and policies that encourage capital and infrastructure investment to ensure 
robust infrastructure investment, not just in transportation, uh, but also in broadband networks, particularly in rural broadband uh, connectivity. Um, energy infrastructure is a critical piece uh, of that particular plank to make sure that we keep energy moving efficiently uh, and ensuring that businesses and um, uh, homeowners uh, have access to low cost energy here in southwestern Pennsylvania. Um, we think one uh, particular um, a manifestation of that policy would be greater facilitation of natural gas pipelines so that we connect uh, people to the opportunities that exist uh, with low cost energy. Um, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, we are now uh, the second highest um, U.S. natural gas producing state. Uh, the way in which we transport natural gas and gas liquids is increasingly important to our region uh, and we think investment needs to reflect that. Many of you may have seen the Forge the Future report um, that was drafted uh, a few months ago, and it was a, a joint collaborative effort uh, between People's Natural Gas, and, and I should note that um, People's CEO, Morgan O'Brien, is the chairman of the Greater Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, uh, and Chevron um, uh, took part in the study. It really provides a nice blueprint, um, at least in the, in the near term, uh, for some of the things we need to focus on to make sure that we uh, are fully leveraging this world-class energy asset that we have here in Western Pennsylvania. Um, the second key point for, from our view, from our standpoint, uh, to push on the policy side is on workforce um, and education. Um, we did a study last year um, called Inflection Report uh, that demonstrated in uh, clear terms with data backing it up uh, that a strong education system and a well-trained uh, workforce uh, is imperative to private sector success and in fact will be one of the things uh, that employers look for when they're making a determination on where to make investments and where to locate uh, their businesses and, and um, add additional jobs to existing businesses. Uh, we see a critical need to invest in the labor marketplace high skill training and bridging a great divide between educators and employers uh, so that we can align our labor supply and pipeline uh, with the market and where it's headed and particularly important in that space uh, is creating a better pipeline if you will uh, between the business community and educators to make sure that the curriculum whether it's in the career and technical space or whether it's in the K-12 space uh, is reflective of what businesses and employers are looking for uh, in new employees and, and new hires. The last area I, I want to hit on um, that we believe is absolutely critical uh, to any growth agenda in Pennsylvania, uh, and it's, it's some of which, uh, some of what Rachel touched on earlier, uh, and that's tax and regulatory policy. Uh, we believe we have to reduce uh, our 9.9% corporate net income tax rate and lift the cap on the carryover of net operating loss uh, deductions. Um, the, the CNI rate uh, in many cases we found is a red flag uh, for businesses even before they take a deeper dive uh, at some of the other strengths that Pennsylvania um, currently possesses. Uh, and Pennsylvania is one of only a handful of states right now uh, that caps the amount of net operating losses a company can offset against its current uh, corporate net income. Uh, for cyclical companies like manufacturing and energy companies, uh, like startup companies, this is particularly important because it means their effective tax rate uh, in Pennsylvania is several times higher than, than competing states. Uh, and again, it's one of those things like the current CNI rate uh, that takes us out of the discussion at the front end rather than allowing us to make an argument uh, at the back end. The regulatory process that Rachel touched on is another area uh, that we think is absolutely critical uh, to reform in Pennsylvania, uh, and that's one of those areas that doesn't cost the state a thing. It's reconfiguring uh, a lot of the agencies that, that currently exist. The one particular problem that we've heard from a number uh, of our stakeholders is the inconsistency uh, between DEP regional offices, um, that the southwestern office uh, has one uh, turnaround time, the northeastern office has something that's completely different, uh, and other offices are scattered all over the place. Uh, we think consistency in the turnaround time for permits is important, and we think the overall regulatory reform that's needed uh, is also something that's very important. Um, and so again, it's a pleasure to join you. We look forward to, to working with all of you 
uh, as we have this growth agenda discussion through the end of this year and certainly into 2018 because we think uh, the Commonwealth is really well positioned to take advantage of the strengths that I mentioned, uh, particularly if we're able to align some of our policies uh, around some of those strengths that the Commonwealth innately possesses, uh, you know, one of which is obviously our world-class energy supply. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the House Republican Policy Committee, thanks once again for inviting me to speak before the committee today. Certainly appreciate the continued interest, not only in the upstream development of our shale resources here in the Commonwealth, but also the downstream use of natural gas and natural gas liquids that are rapidly becoming a tool to grow our economy. I think most of you know my name is Dave Spiegelmeyer. I grew up in central Pennsylvania, and I have the honor of representing uh, the Marcellus Shale Coalition, the trade association that represents about 95 percent of the unconventional natural gas development here in the Commonwealth, a uh, development that has moved Pennsylvania from a uh, production state of producing about a quarter of our natural gas supply in 2008 to now providing nearly 20 percent of America's natural gas supply, and we're now number two producer of natural gas here in the country. So we're really proud of that in a very, very short period of time. Today as part of the hearing, I know you want to focus on economic development opportunities as well as the competitive issues that stand in the way of progress. I think, first of all, I'd be remiss if I didn't address an issue that's been hot before you in the last two months, the issue of taxation. And I'd like to shine a light today on the Governor's announcement just yesterday announcing the funding of some 227 new projects from the Commonwealth Finance Authority, projects that are funded from the tax collection of Pennsylvania's unique in impact tax, a tax that you passed in 2012, and a tax that's generated $1.2 billion of tax proceeds that have assisted all 67 counties of the Commonwealth. As you know, the impact tax funds not only county and local governments, but it also funds state agencies. And the impact tax through the Commonwealth Finance Authority is used to enhance environmental protection, revitalize communities, and improve transportation networks. The funding announced yesterday will support 112 transportation-related projects in 36 counties. It funds 12 watershed protection projects and provide upgrades to four sewage treatment plants. It invests another $10 million in greenways, trails, and an additional $3 million for flood control projects. I bring this to your attention because we remain at loggerheads over claims that the industry doesn't pay a tax. I know most in this committee agree that we pay a tax. Some may believe it's best allocated to the general fund. Some may believe that we don't collect enough. But I think you know that despite its unique structure that has collected $1.2 billion since April of 2012, it does constitute a tax and sits atop all the other taxes that Pennsylvania collects upon our industry. As I mentioned before, in 2016, Pennsylvania's impact uh, tax has collected more than the severance tax collections of West Virginia, Ohio, Arkansas, and Colorado combined in 2016. Some would say, well, that's because we produce more gas, and the answer is no, we do not. Could you list those four states again? Yes, I sure will. Faster than West I can Virginia, write Ohio, Arkansas, and Colorado. Our impact tax collects more in revenue. Last year, $173 million more than those four states combined. Thank you. The other item in this debate that I think challenges or baffles common sense are the claims that the gas is here. Where else are they going to go? In 2011, we had 117 active rigs active here in the Commonwealth at our peak. Today, we have 31 active rigs in Pennsylvania. The Permian Basin in West Texas and New Mexico has close to 350 active drilling rigs today, pursuing natural gas and, li and, and, oil, uh, and liquids, primarily oil. That's our competition for capital. It's real, as is Ohio, as is West Virginia, as is Louisiana, and in the northern states up in the Bakken. Ohio and West Virginia typically turn regulatory permits, combined permits for drilling and erosion and sedimentation control in 30 days to 45 days. While we've experienced some slight improvement, the southwest region of the DEP has issued ESC GP2 permits, 45 of those in 2017, with an average turnaround time of 262 days. Since June, of, June, uh, June 17th, 12 additional ESCGP2 permits have been issued from the region. That's about one a week. 
Well permits are somewhat standard in their application. We average 133 days in the southwest region to turn a drilling permit. I think most of you know that we sat silent on this long enough. Those delays and the lack of certainty in permitting are costing Pennsylvania capital allocation and make no mistake, they're costing us jobs. To be fair to DEP, the northwest region and the north central regions of DEP are far more predictable and certain, but they use roughly double the time allocated for permit review, which is 45 days by statute. Average turnaround time for those regions for a well permit has been roughly 90 days when the statutory prescribed turnaround time, again, is 45. There are some very bright spots that many of you are well aware of in our industry, and I'll quickly try and identify a few of those for you. As for economic development, we have the most affordable energy on the planet that exists here in Pennsylvania today. Utility pricing, and when I compare utility pricing, gas purchase prices of 2008, natural gas utility pricing is 54 to, 8, 54 to 81 percent less than it was in 2008. Those are enormous consumer benefits and can be used to grow our economy and manufacturing. As, uh, as Matt Smith mentioned a few moments ago, the study just recently completed by McKinsey, funded by Chevron and People's Natural Gas called Forge the Future, a pathway for Pen uh, Pennsylvania's economic opportunity through natural gas, identifies $60 billion of economic growth in Pennsylvania by 2025 if we pave the way to use natural gas to grow uh, manufacturing in our state. Few know, what most folks that use natural gas realize that we use it for heating, cooking, heating our hot water, drying our clothes. But nearly every single consumer product that we touch today is manufactured through the use of natural gas. All steel, glass, plastics, chemicals, fertilizers, powdered metals, the pharmaceutical medications that are life sustaining. About a third today of our power generation electrons are produced with natural gas. It touches our lives in so many ways every single day. Many of you are well aware of the investments being made just to our west at Royal Dutch Shell with the petrochemical facility in Beaver County. Much like we've talked about uh, the steel manufacturing industry and what it's meant for this region, I think we're on the, on the, um, the verge of a birth announcement for new plastics manufacturing in our region to be able to take ethane to reduce, reduce ethylene to ethylene, to secondarily reduce ethylene to polyethylene and develop low density and high density plastics, much like we have in front of us with the table, with bottles, with the plastic sheeting that goes over your clothes at the, at the, uh, at the dry cleaners, to every single plastic product we touch today. The discussion we have today is the 6,000 jobs that are being developed at that plant many of them in the labor force, as well as the 600 permanent jobs. I would tell you in 10 years from now, I think we won't be focused on that plant, but we'll be talking about the manufacturing being developed, not only here in Pennsylvania, but across this region, developing the many, many products that can be produced by the raw materials that will be generated from that location. Not long ago, this committee met at Marcus Hook. Uh, the liquids being produced in the southwestern region of Pennsylvania, and you know, I know Representative James comes from a, uh, a, a long heritage uh, of natural gas development. It's been primarily a dry gas play in most of the Commonwealth, but the southwestern part of Pennsylvania, when we produce natural gas, it's an under-pressured area of the Marcellus and the Utica Shale area. It actually delivers heavy hydrocarbons, ethane, pentane, butane, isobutane, propane, natural gasolines that are used for a number of different products that are manufactured not only across the Commonwealth but across our nation. The ethane piece is one that's not only fueling the development of the facility in Beaver County, but it's also been a, uh, a regenerator for Marcus Hook. The Mariner 1 pipeline went into effect a little over a year ago. It moves ethane into the Port of Philadelphia. Ethane that will be used in chemical manufacturing, not only here in the United States but abroad, is underway at that location. You fly into the Philadelphia airport, airport, don't be surprised to look down and see a tanker sitting there that says shale gas for Europe or shale gas for chemicals. Ethane is moving out of the Port of Philadelphia today to Norway and other European nations to be able to fuel their resurgence in manufacturing as well. Marcus Hook also has a second line uh, that's underway moving, will, will move both propane and butane to the Port of Philadelphia. There'll be a propanizer developed to be, be able to split cryogenically the propane off to use for home heating and agricultural use. Butane will be used for accelerants and propellants as well. 
we sit here today at United States Steel, and there are applications that are similar to this across Pennsylvania that I think are worth celebrating. I think many of you have probably heard uh, in northern Pennsylvania, Procter & Gamble basically cut the power pole and generates their own power on site by having shale wells on their own property. I think United States Steel has the same opportunities and may be willing to talk about some of that today, but I think there's an opportunity to develop our resources here in this region to not only fuel new manufacturing growth and new economic opportunities for our companies, but also for our commonwealth and for our nation. Looking forward to your questions and thanks for having me here today. Thank you, all three of you, very informative and very precise. Uh, Matt, we know you're under a little tight time restraint. I'm gonna ask the members to start with their questions for you first. Not to put you under the gun, but batter up. First one is uh, Representative James, followed up by Representative Ortita. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Smith. Um, in regard to your three themes, and in particular the second one, uh, you may have said something, but I perhaps didn't hear it, regarding the collaboration between the business end of things and the education end of things. Mm -hmm. Do you have that happening now so that uh, schools are aware of the type of workers that are required. Yeah, we, we have, thanks for that question, Representative. It, the, the workforce issue is critical. We, we have that happening in the early stages, but it's not uh, nearly robust enough. And, and I'll give you a specific example um, that was cited in the inflection, uh, point, inflection point report. Um, and, and this is applicable in the career and technical space. Uh, in 2000 and, uh, 15, uh, in our 10 county region, it was determined uh, that there was a need for around um, 800 um, uh, machine tool technicians um, in the 10 county region. Our career and technical education system in that year produced of around 375 machine tool technicians. And so we had a gap of around a little more than 400 uh, job openings that were left unfilled. The starting salary for a machine tool technician uh, at that time was right around 39,000. So that would be a specific area where, um, you know, and this is what we're building towards, where the employers in the region would say, we're looking for machine tool technicians. This is the specific skill set we're looking for. Uh, we need our CTE system to produce X number of, of job um, applicants for that particular position. It's happening, but it's, it, it needs to be ramped up. We're encouraged with the progress, uh, particularly in the career and technical space, because we think that's a critical piece uh, to solving the workforce, um, uh, workforce of the future question, if you will. Um, and so we're encouraged, but we'll continue to work on it. Representative Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for your testimony, Matt. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, uh, the first question I'm going to ask of you first, and then I'll ask the, the building trades later after they, they, and kind of building after what uh, Representative James had said. Um, are, are we doing anything to help develop programs, partnerships, business partnerships, apprenticeship programs with the local schools at the middle school level, at the high school level, outside of the, um, like the Votech centers to help gear and shift people towards those types of skills and trades? Yeah, I mean, the, the building trades um, can, can amplify this, but uh, they're doing, I think, um, you know, a really uh, ramped up job in reaching out, um, not only into high schools, but as you mentioned, it's, it's critically important to reach uh, kids and families when uh, children are in third and fourth and fifth and sixth grade. That's when you can really uh, spark an interest and, and get them interested in uh, you know, building something or working with their hands where that might be uh, an appropriate career pathway um, for that particular individual. So the building trades are doing a really effective job. M employers more and more are, are getting into the schools uh, to also do that. Um, you know, members of, of the MSC and I know the, the Coal Association have done that specifically. Um, so yeah, it's, it's happening now. And again, it's one of those things as we transition from a system that uh, was built to supply workers in one way, you know, in many cases, we, um, I think, probably pushed students to a four-year school that where it might not have been the best career pathway for that individual. Right. Uh, the more we transition to a system where uh, the career pathway is really constructed for that individual uh, and for that region and what we know that will be available in terms of jobs, 
we're seeing greater involvement in the schools, uh, even even more so now. Good, and, and even outside of the trades, I'd love to work with you in the chamber on developing other programs where we can bring in businesses to partner up with the schools to come up with um, an apprenticeship type program that gives them ex real world experience at an earlier level before they go to college or before they go to a trade school. Um, I think that's what our education system seems to be missing these days. Um, real life practical experience. This way it can gear them in a, in a specific direction. And, I have one other quick question, and then I will gladly turn the mic over to the chairman again. Um, you had mentioned in your testimony that in good times and bad, 5.3% seems to be the, the return on whether we raise taxes, lower taxes, add new taxes, or, or, or whatever the case may be. I just want to confirm that you that you that, that was what the report said. Cause yep. It was, and I can certainly um, circulate to the committee members uh, through the chairman the, the um, report in more detail, but yes, it was over a 17-year time period. Uh, the state's annual tax re revenue consistently returned 5.3% of the state's total gross domestic product. Um, no matter what happened with new taxes, with rates uh, being increased, new revenue wasn't generated more than that percentage because businesses and individuals adjusted their behavior um, uh, to reflect the increase in taxes and therefore the GDP uh, in those cases was reflective and therefore uh, lower and, and didn't increase the revenue as a total of the of the overall pie. All right. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And thank you, Matt. I was going to ask you about getting that report. You can give it to either Bob or I and we'll be sure yep. to circulate. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Representative Nelson, then Representative Oberlander. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Matt, we are really peppering you with some questions because I know your, your time is limited. But um, I kind of have a two-part question that parallels opportunity loss versus opportunity cost. Um, as the, the head of the chamber, if you could touch a little bit on opportunity loss, let's say specifically to our region, the announcement of Chevron um, to you know losing them, their corporate headquarters to Louisiana and what that means for jobs and and um, the potential building of their facilities um, and the other opportunity loss side of it when you mentioned about pipelines and I know we have energy producers here but from your perspective if we can't transfer gas energy through pipelines and we have to start to use trucks um, what does that opportunity cost for trucks that are compressed natural gas through our communities? What, is, what does that do to the Allegheny County network? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll let, um, you know, Dave address some of the specifics on that in, in the numbers. But, you know, the, the, um, you know it, it, from what I understand, the inefficiency um, and the sort of increased cost, um, not only to the companies, but then that will be passed on to consumers and not getting the product as efficiently and effectively uh, to consumers uh, will have effects up and down the chain. Um, you're going to have uh, companies that have, have a higher cost to operate. Uh, you're going to have consumers that have a higher utility cost, as Dave, David mentioned. Uh, the, one of the strengths uh, certainly reflected as a tangible benefit from uh, the energy industry here in southwestern Pennsylvania has been drastically decreased utility costs for, for homeowners and, and consumers. And so I think we go in the opposite direction if we increase uh, the cost to deliver those particular goods to, to the end user, certainly. You have time for another question? Yep. Very good. Uh, Representative Oberlander. Thank you, Matt. I'm glad you can stay for just Thanks. a couple more minutes. Oh, yeah. It's always good to see you. As an economic, a previous economic developer, um, I was certainly aware of manufacturing component on our economy and its higher multiplier on our communities. But you covered a couple of other details that were not in your testimony that I couldn't write fast enough to catch. Yeah. So I wanted to just um, confirm, you said that the average wage of those energy sectors and manufacturing was 89420 Is that correct? Yes. In 2016, the average annual wage for the energy sector in the Pittsburgh MSA was 89240 Okay, and it is how much more than the other sectors? It's that that's seventy-one percent higher than the average job in the Pittsburgh region. So not just wow. you know a couple specific sectors, but the the entire uh, uh, 
you know, panoply of, of jobs. Wow, thank you for sharing that. That really solidifies what I already believed, but to hear that uh, stated in such a, a clear way is outstanding. So yep. thank you for sharing that, thank I appreciate you. it. Not last but not least, Representative Sankey. Um, Matt, you don't have to stay here, but I'd like you to come back to the softball game in Harrisburg. <laughs> Great softball player. Um, I, my, I have the simplest question, but I want to make a comment first. Uh, I, so much of what you said it resonates, and it has to resonate with everyone. And the message, the narrative has to be changed for us of, of pro-growth and pro-jobs. Um, a lot of people don't know we lost a, a plastics manufacturer in Pennsylvania who went to Houston, not because of our highest corporate tax rate, not because of 3.07 PIT, but literally waiting, waiting on permission from the government, waiting on permits. The, the speed of business does not coincide with the speed of government. Um, all I really want from you guys is, uh, do you have a copy of your, which your, your dialogue today? Because I'd like to have it for, for my own records. And I, I just, I appreciate what, every, what you guys did. Uh, I think we're all friends, but um, your voice should be loud and we want to change the narrative to understand that everybody benefits from this, everybody in Pennsylvania, from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh to, to Harrisburg. So thanks for being here, and thanks for the positive message. Thank you. Uh, Representative, thank you to show the efficiency of our committee. Here's his testimony. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry you were skipped over. Other questions for Rachel or David? To my far left, uh, Representative or tea time. Rachel, not so much of a question, but just an ask. Can you give us a list? Um, you don't have to do it today, but when you get a chance uh, of what you consider the most costly regulations at the state level for your industry? I, I certainly could. I can compile something for you. OK, thank you. The good news, Rachel, is I wrote so many questions down, I can't remember which one I want to get to, nor can I read half of them. But um, I actually just wanted, for the editorial purposes of those who might be listening, for you to explain a little bit. You talked about thermal coal and the importance of that, especially in the manufacturing metal. I happen to, my father was a metallurgist, my grandfather worked for Bethlehem Steel. So I have a little bit of knowledge, but I think the average person doesn't understand why we need some of these commodities to produce these other commodities and why coal works best. If you could just take a moment to elaborate on that. Sure. In Pennsylvania, the, in the bituminous coal fields, which are plentiful, we have thermal coal and metallurgical coal. And the thermal coal is primarily used to, to generate electricity. The metallurgical coal has a, is, more, is lower volatile and has a different composition and a higher burn rate, and therefore is used to create the coke that creates the steel that is dedicated to the manufacturing industry. So U.S. Steel, we get them on both ends. We provide the affordable baseload electricity to, to let them operate, and then we also provide them the metallurgical coal that they need to generate the steel. And again, I'm taking advantage of your knowledge. Uh, just for those listeners who may not be here, a definition of the coke that's created and your definition of why the, the importance of the low volatility. A lot of that has to do with the combustion when the coal is used and mixed to make the iron ore that makes the coke. So when you have metallurgical coal that goes into a furnace, it, it, it has a certain weight to it. And when it comes out, it's almost like charcoal. Right. And then that turns into the steel that is used for our cars and our refrigerators and our bridges. And I actually brought a magazine with me today that I didn't even mention, but it, it landed on my desk two days ago. And it highlighted a Pennsylvania company that used, um, and I don't have it open right now, but used millions of tons to reconstruct the Tappan Zee Bridge in New York City. So that was Pennsylvania coal that made Pennsylvania steel that was used by a Pennsylvania company to go to New York City and supported about 7,000 jobs in just the, production, the construction of that bridge. So that kind of highlights the importance and the domino effect of the coal industry and its, and its impact on manufacturing and economic development and infrastructure. No, and I appreciate that because I think it's important for us to realize that um, a lot of the products we use on a day-to-day -day basis are very much dependent on your industry providing us the energy resources in order to actually come up with that great chemistry 
to make those steel products. Correct. If you want to drive a car, the, the, the frame of it is likely made by steel. And if it's electric, Dave and I would be happy to provide you the affordable electricity to charge that car. <laughs> yes. Uh, my friends that have electric cars, I remind them that it's really not coming down off of a kite from the skies <laughs> to charge their car at night. Somebody's generating that electricity. But, you know, sadly, as consumers, sometimes we forget about that, and I don't think we really appreciate that damning regula regulations and trying to kill an industry because you might have philosophical differences has a tremendous systemic impact on our communities as a whole, our state as a whole, and our state standing in the, co in the country. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Uh, Representative Nelson has another question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my question is for both of you. We talked about one of the, the short questions um, Ms. Gleason, you mentioned that the application process, the stack would be as high as you. Um, as where I sit today, it would be about is, that high. Is, um, it's just a, a quickie, but not the end of my question. I, that's not electronic? No, and to DEP's credit, they have recently tried to transition to electronic permitting, and actually the new surface mining bituminous coal permit was the guinea pig for that process, and it was the first one to go to e-permitting. Um, now that said, that rolled out last February. There have been several hiccups in it. Um, I think we finally had our first new surface mining permit submitted maybe a month or so ago. And one of our consultants that does permitting worked with DEP very closely to go through all the snags and the holes. But no, none of that is, is electronic at this point. Um, and a lot of it's duplicative. So when they are developing the new modules for the e-permitting, they are addressing some of the duplicative items. Um, but until that, I mean, to do a new underground mining permit electronically would take a very long time because there are so many intricacies and modules and, and even, you know, in working with natural gas, we work very close as industries in developing um, standards for how we both extract our gas and our coal in the same area. Um, so, it, but no, it's not electronic. Mm -hmm. um, the next portion of my question, it kind of overlaps with the production of coal and the extraction of natural gas. You know, in um, Wyoming and in Texas, the Department of Energy has launched some pretty successful research where they're using high-end clean coal technology, capturing that off gas and delivering it underground to really skyrocket the production of those um, natural gas wells in that area. You know, I, I think um, earlier this year, we had an opportunity to go to the White House and, and listen and meet with, you know, the woman who's coordinating some of those programs. And we have, uh, you know, just south of here, a federal um, facility. You know, maybe there is an opportunity in these coming years to launch, you know, a similar project in Pennsylvania. If we're number three, you know, I, it'd be great for us to, to be able to get and apply that high-end technology that we talked about earlier with coal and natural gas to be able to really create a, a win. Yeah, Representative, the, you're, you're talking about enhanced oil recovery primarily, and there's certainly technology that's been used on the gas side. I would tell you in tight formations like the Marcellus and the Utica, uh, I would tell you that hydraulic fracturing technology, which has been used here in the Commonwealth since the 1940s, is probably the better technology to release natural gas and the cost-effective technology to release gas to the burner tip. So uh, certainly enhanced oil recovery techniques, uh, carbon sequestration, other, ma other measures to be able to uh, enhance liquids recovery is probably where it's been most proven and proved to be uh, successful in the U.S. So you know, we've certainly helped, helped take a look at all that. Great. And if I could add to that, a lot of that also probably depends on the geology. Our geology is quite different than that in Wyoming and in Texas. I mean, in Wyoming, it's it's very flat and there's a lot of surface mining and they go down very deep and it's a very it's different challenges mm -hmm. my last question and thank you mr chairman was is um comparing pennsylvania i think un unfortunately at times we just look at ourselves and not necessarily the growth of other states around us um it can you touch on um the back to that opportunity loss concept the consequence of the delay in the permitting process um, to both investment and development and then how that has impacted growth in Pennsylvania. It's nice to hear that we're doing more coal and more gas, but as compared to gas and coal in some of those other producing states, are they still like we're growing, but are they outperforming our growth? 
from strictly a coal mining perspective, I will say that our neighboring states, West Virginia and Ohio, are much more friendly in the permitting process, and they have more operations as a result, especially in West Virginia. Um, I have a few members of the Pennsylvania Coal Alliance that aren't active producers in Pennsylvania because they're only they're permitted in West Virginia and they're portals in West Virginia, but they are mining under Pennsylvania but they're not a Pennsylvania producer of coal. So because their permitting process is easier in West Virginia or in Ohio, that's where they go in and then it's an underground process. Representative, we have a world-class resource here in Pennsylvania and the measurement's pretty, cl pretty quick and pretty clear. We've watched Ohio increase rig counts uh, from 17 this spring to 28 today. We've lost 10% of our rig count in the last three months. Uh, we're not getting it right here right now, and it primarily is because of permitting. We've watched a, a exponential growth in rig count in the Permian Basin. And when I, I, I made it part of my testimony today that when folks say that operators have nowhere else to go, nothing can be further from the truth. Many of the operators that are active here in Pennsylvania are active in, in the Bakken states up in North Dakota. They're active in the Permian in West Texas and New Mexico. You know, one of my largest members, XTO Energy, which is an Exxon subsidiary, has 60 active rigs right now in the, uh, the Permian Basin. They have one in Pennsylvania today. Uh, and they're probably doing it to hold acreage because we're a difficult place to do business. I think uh, uh, former representative of Smith and you know, head of the chamber, he had mentioned the Forge the Future pro uh, project. And he mentioned the Allegheny Conference study where there's 5.3% return in tax revenue from from investment growth. He also mentioned Forge the Future, but he didn't pick up what the what the target is. They believe that sixty billion dollars of GDP growth can occur between now and twenty twenty five through the use of natural gas and natural gas liquids here in the Commonwealth. That's an immediate three billion dollars at five point three percent tax rate. It's an immediate return of three billion dollars of new tax revenue for the Commonwealth. Again, we need to focus on the downstream use that generate new jobs and opportunities for our children. Uh, and I, I would tell you, I think it's an enormous winner if we get that equation right. Just a quick response to Representative Titi's question, or Titi's question earlier about education. I, one thing that wasn't mentioned that I wanted to mention that is active today is Junior Achievement has a careers in, ed, in energy education program that's ongoing here in the Commonwealth, and they are in the grade schools and they are in the middle schools. And I know a number of major uh, investors in this play are investing with Junior Achievement and trying to get our kids involved in careers in energy education. That's great to hear. I remember my father bringing metallurgical movies into my third grade class and have these kids watch these big vats of molten metal, but uh, I was proud of them. I thought it was pretty cool. I became a politician, but that doesn't mean anything. I believe Representative Walsh has a question. Uh, this is for uh, Rachel. Uh, I guess my inner lawyer is, is coming through here, but you touched on the um, uh, permanent appeal process. Uh, who carries the burden and what that burden may be. Uh, can you expound on that a little bit, please? Well, right now, any permit that's issued by our state DEP can be appealed to our Environmental Hearing Board. And one of the um, efforts that some of our very well-funded adversaries <coughs> use is to appeal our permits. And in fact, um, this summer we had Act 32 uh, became enacted, which was a response to one of those court appeals that was taking two years for the EHP to decide on. It was filed in 2014. They heard it finally in 2016. 2017 later, we still don't have a decision. Threatened, we had a mine closed for uh, several weeks. Uh, 500 people got laid off. Um, that mine is the largest underground mining complex in North America and threatened the employment of about 2,000 people. So that's one of those efforts that because the Environmental Hearing Board didn't come to a decision in time to match the production schedule, um, we had to do something legislatively and I appreciate all of your support on that. Um, but it's a continued effort. There are certain associations um, in middle and southwestern Pennsylvania that are um, nationally funded that you know, just use their resources for the legalese of filing permit appeals and delaying the process. Uh, in, in referring to that legislation, um, please refresh my memory. Are there any penalties for an, an appeal that might be found to be meritless? Not to my knowledge. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Just a quick add, if I may. Opponents of our industry that, that Rachel spoke about a moment ago oftentimes are lined up to believe that coal, gas, and other baseload fuels are opponents of renewables. I would share with you that, that we're the fitting partner for renewable energy. Well, you don't have, if you don't have available baseload power, renewable intermittent power sources really don't work. And you don't manufacture solar panels and, and, and windmills without coal and natural gas being used in our power generation facilities and used in the manufacturing process to be able to smelt glass and to make metal to be able to produce those products. Great clarification. I have two quick questions, if I may. Um, Dave, you had talked about the impact tax at Pennsylvania Institute under uh, Governor Corbett, and I just want to make sure I have my facts clarified. You say that we are generating more on the annual basis through our impact tax than the four neighboring states have in their severance tax? Took a look at 2016 collections. We collected 170. Is your, is your microphone on? Yes, sir. I, I looked at 2016 numbers, and if I look at the collections of our impact tax in 2016 at 173 million dollars, we outpaced by a little over three million dollars the collections of Arkansas, Colorado, West Virginia, and Ohio combined. Okay. And the other thing, either one of you can answer this because we hear this commonly, whether it's in the construction business, we hear it in agriculture, we hear it a lot of people that just want to put a hole in the ground. That even though our own statutes require DEP's action within 45 days and a lot of these earth disturbance permits, on average we're seeing 200 plus days. Uh, just for our audience, why is that so detrimental to a business? We lack certainty. Operators that invest want to be able to invest to see a return on that investment. When you have a delay of now in the southwest region, 262 days, they can deploy that capital far uh, you know, in a, in a state like Ohio and get a return on that investment far quicker than they can here in Pennsylvania. So do I think it's a deterrent for capital investment in Pennsylvania? I sure do. I would also say that you know, it didn't become part of my testimony, and we didn't really talk much about it, but the, the lack of adequate pipeline infrastructure has certainly been a deterrent to capital investment here. It's been far harder and more difficult to build infrastructure today than it was just 10 years ago. Uh, we have about a dozen major pipeline infrastructure projects that are underway in Pennsylvania. That disparity between NYMEX pricing for natural gas, the average pricing the gas sells for across the nation, and the discount that operators receive in Pennsylvania, we think over time will narrow. But right now, we have the deepest discounts to NYMEX pricing here in Pennsylvania that exist anywhere else in the nation. It's also been an enormous deterrent. Uh, for capital investment here in Pennsylvania, and you couple that with delayed permits to get projects in the ground, it's been a, it, that's been a real sore spot and a loser for us long term. I, I know in the ag and construction, you know, this stuff's outside, and so they're already dealing with weather issues. If you're waiting 200, 250, 260 days, there's not generally 260 good days in a calendar year of good weather that uh, I don't think a lot of people appreciate what a deterrent that is. And obviously that's people that are not going to work because we don't have the jobs moving. You also have to, you also have to balance, uh, you know, things like bat, you know, bats. They have different seasons that are in, you know, where they, where they, um, where they nest. Yeah, yeah. So you, got, you, can't, you can't cut trees on a pipeline right away during certain periods of time. So if you have a, a, a permit that's delayed beyond the primary season where you can, to harvest trees to develop a, uh, a pipeline right away. It may delay that project for a year or more. Thank you very much. Last question for me is uh, how can the state better assist in pipeline deployment? Is there anything specific we can do or something we could be doing better that we may already be enrolled in? You know, the debate's ongoing on a lot of different fronts, you know, not just in our industry, but upholding the standards that the legislature has set for returning permits in a predictable and certain period of time. It's, it's job one for investors to be able to have a predictable period of time for where they can determine when they can begin operations and, and, and if they don't have a complete application to hear that sooner. Uh, again, I, was, I tried to be clear in my testimony that there's certainly better performance in uh, other regions of the Commonwealth, the North Central and Northwest region, we certainly have a far more predictable environment, but uh, the Southwest, we really struggle. And I think that, you know, over the last 
three months, we've turned a dozen earth disturbance permits. That's one permit a week for an entire staff. It just seems to me to be a, a broken system that needs to be repaired. With all um, respect towards the, the secretary of the DEP, he has shared with me personally that they are working to try and address those issues. They just haven't hit the home run there yet to try and get a more predictable turnaround time for permits. Uh, we've had com similar conversations with the secretary, and I think you have our commitment of our committee to stay on that to try to get better continuity throughout the Commonwealth. There are some regions that are doing very well. Uh, we want Pennsylvania to be a leader, and I think we have great possibilities for some tremendous job opportunities. You folks have done a good job testifying, sharing that. We appreciate what your industry does and the great employment opportunities. Thank you very much. Our second uh, panel of testifiers will be Christopher Massiano, United States Steel Corporation, Petra Mitchell from the Catalyst Connection, as well as Jeff Nobers, Builders Guild of Western Pennsylvania. Chris Massantonio, is that any better? My apologies for that. Uh, as protocol, we will start with the young lady in the middle, go to her right, and then to her left, if that's okay. Young lady, then we'll um, have the members ask questions when all three testifiers are done. We do truly, truly appreciate you taking time to be with us today, today and I hope we can have a constructive dialogue to learn from you and also uh, provide you some guidance as well. Great. Well, thank you very much, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Petra Mitchell, and I do really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. I am the president and CEO of Callus Connection. We're an economic development organization. We serve our region's small and medium-sized manufacturers. That's companies that have less than 500 employees per location. And we provide them technical assistance, management consulting, workforce development, and a host of other services designed to help small companies grow their business, improve productivity, and create and retain jobs. And I was pleased to hear earlier some of the metrics associated with manufacturing, at least in uh, southwestern Pennsylvania. As we know and as we've heard, as individual manufacturing companies grow and succeed, collectively they impact the regional economy, and when manufacturing succeeds, everybody in the community has the opportunity to prosper. So Kellis Connection is funded in part by the federal government through a program called the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, or MEP. This is a U.S. Department of Commerce initiative where every square inch of the United States is covered by an MEP. And in Pennsylvania, we're very fortunate to have the Industrial Resource Center, or IRC, program, which for the first time now is part of the new Manufacturing PA initiative, which I believe many of you supported. I know I've talked to a number of you and your colleagues uh, over the last few years about that particular program. That program uh, will fund the IRC program. It will also fund a training to career program and a university innovation initiative, which I hadn't planned to go into the details of those, but I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. In addition to Manufacturing PA, my organization secures uh, funding from other agencies, other federal agencies, as well as other private and local sources like our foundation community and private industry. Using those resources, we have uh, established three new strategies, three new regional initiatives that I think you may uh, have an interest in learning about. So the first is to help small companies accelerate the pace of technology adoption. What I mean by that is helping them to compete with additive manufacturing or 3D printing, helping them to compete with robotics and autom automation, advanced materials, and other advanced technologies. As you can imagine, as companies progress down this strategy, it creates a new challenge for them, or a, accelerates a new challenge for them, which is finding a skilled and qualified workforce to fill these new advanced manufacturing jobs. That leads me to our second strategy, which is to introduce and coordinate employer-led apprenticeship programs. We are initially focusing on a program that's an entry level called the Industrial Manufacturing Technician and eventually working towards building an advanced manufacturing apprenticeship program, again focused on robotics and automation. 
Developing these programs then presents another challenge, which uh, again was addressed earlier, and that is how do we create the pipeline of individuals, whether that's students or existing job seekers, that want to uh, pursue these advanced manufacturing technology jobs and have the skills to do so. And so that leads me to our third initiative, which is helping to introduce careers and more importantly, workplace learning opportunities to our region's middle school and high school students. And in particular, our initiatives around our middle school video contest and our high school manufacturing innovation challenge. So for purposes of this uh, talk, I'm going to focus on our employer-led apprenticeship programs. But like I said, I'm, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions on any of those topics. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, apprenticeship program is a great way for uh, job seekers to earn and learn. They become employees of the company. They learn on-the-job skills and competencies, and then also participate in related instruction, which can then lead to a credential, certainly a certificate, and can then uh, also pave the way for further uh, professional development down the road. Apprenticeship programs can be sponsored by employers, joint employer and labor groups, and or employer associations, and probably, as you know, in the building trades, joint employer and labor group apprenticeship programs are very popular. Pennsylvania has 540 registered apprenticeship programs in manufacturing and related sector. An individual company can have many registered apprenticeship programs uh, that fit the needs of their workforce. They offer many benefits to, prog uh, to an employers, as I mentioned al already. One of the most important in this uh, time of uh, significant competition for skilled workers is it enables an employer to become an employer of choice. They demonstrate that they are willing to invest in their employees, develop them, uh, invest in training, and a variety of other um, ancillary activities. In a recent study, 80% of companies who invest in apprentices report a significant increase in retention, and 90% believe that apprenticeship programs have led to a better workforce for them and their company. Also, as I mentioned, apprenticeship programs provide significant value to job seekers and individuals because, again, you are earning a wage, uh, a good wage, and as you progress through an apprenticeship program, you are entitled to additional co compensation, you know, again, as you meet certain competencies and requirements of the program. So the process uh, for an employer-led apprenticeship program begins with the employer. An employer has to decide what is the job that is required, that is conducive to an apprenticeship program. They have to design that job. They have to identify all the related competencies, the related instruction. This can be quite a time-consuming task. Um, and many employers struggle with the resources to be able to do that. And that's where intermediaries like Hallis Connection and various other partners, workforce investment boards, chambers of commerce, and others can play. We can help coordinate uh, with employers. We can help to enable the development of these jobs, competencies, and related instruction. We can coordinate with training providers, and more importantly, help to bring financial resources to the table because the related instruction part of an apprenticeship program can become quite costly. An example of this program is an entry-level program called the Industrial Manufacturing Technician. This was developed in Wisconsin by um, federal funding, and we are working now to bring that to Pennsylvania. It's, uh, like I said, entry-level. It's a 3,000-hour program. It takes about 18 months to complete and has 264 hours of related instruction. The whole point is to make something that's relatively uniform across the board, kind of if you think about if you go to college your freshman year, you take sort of basic classes and then build the foundation and then you can move into specialties as you progress. Companies still have the opportunity to customize the program, but again, uh, it's a, it's, um, 80% of the work has been laid out for them. And also, companies with a common program have the opportunity to combine their resources to share in the related instruction part of the effort, which again can be very costly. As part of our intermediate role, intermediary role, Callus Connection provides the technical expertise, evaluating the plan, walking a company through the process, and more importantly, helping them to become registered with the State Office of Apprenticeship. That is critical if the company wants to be eligible for federal funds for training their employees. It's critical that the program become registered. That's also very important to the individual because then that gives them credentials that they can continue on uh, for their own individual careers. Uh, so in conclusion of the apprenticeship program, we did a recent very small survey of local manufacturers. 
Over half said apprenticeship programs were very important, but only one third of respondents actually have one. And admittedly, we came across many companies that had registered apprenticeship programs, uh, but they were laying dormant. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity to help manufacturers reinvigorate those programs. Uh, just a little anecdote, I did visit one company that told me they had uh, a very functional, very robust apprenticeship program, but when we investigated, it wasn't actually registered. So that was unfortunate for them. We're going to help them, uh, you know, get registered. So again, um, as I mentioned earlier, a critical element of the apprenticeship program is the pipeline of candidates. And um, I agree with Matt Smith's comments earlier, there isn't enough to be done, but there is quite a bit to build on. So uh, recently we just launched a Making Your Future campaign. This is a campaign to target job seekers, to help them learn about new and opportunities in advanced manufacturing. Uh, a finding in the recent uh, Brookings Institution report mentioned that many job seekers in the community just are not aware of what's available to them. So uh, this, is an this is an effort to introduce things like making, introduce training programs, introduce apprenticeship programs, and so forth. Make citizens to makers, makers to job seekers, job seekers to employees. Uh, we also run a middle school and high school career awareness and workplace learning program. And our middle school video contest, uh, literally right now we have well over 200 middle schoolers visiting local manufacturing companies, producing videos on the topic of what's so cool about manufacturing, which will culminate in a awards program in February, which I will uh, invite all of you to because it's very cool. We have over 200 children, their parents, teachers, principals and other administration officials along with hundreds of manufacturers all in one room uh, celebrating manufacturing and more importantly helping these students to uh, pursue you know appropriate relevant uh, careers of st or programs of study in high school so they can become good manufacturing workers when they graduate. Uh, so again thank you again and uh, I guess when we're done I'll have an opportunity to answer some questions which I'll be happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, members of the Policy Committee, for uh, being here. Uh, Mike, U.S. Steel. Hold on, Chris. Welcomes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, U.S. Steel welcomes you again uh, to our Research and Technology Center. We're pleased to be able to host the committee, and I want to personally thank you for addressing these important issues for industry and manufacturing in Pennsylvania. Uh, my name is Chris Mashantonio. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for United States Steel. I'm a third generation U.S. Steel employee, you know, starting with my grandfather who arrived from Italy a number of years ago and found employment at a steel mill not too far from here. Um, I am also the co-chairman of an organization called the Pennsylvania Steel Alliance, which is a joint labor management uh, initiative. My fellow co-chair is uh, Robert McCulloch. Uh, Bobby Mack is the district director for the United Steel Workers District 10. Uh, he wanted to be here today with us, uh, but he could not due to a prior commitment. Uh, I think Bob, though, would agree with uh, the remarks I'm about to share with you. Uh, we've worked very closely uh, over the past few years in helping educate the public and government officials on you know, important policy matters uh, for the Pennsylvania steel industry and the United Steel workers. Um, with that said, I, I have a copy of my remarks that I think each of you have in front of you, as well as a, a copy of a PowerPoint uh, that includes some uh, illustrations and photos of our facilities. Uh, here in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm going to try to follow the uh, PowerPoint with the remarks. Uh, the remarks are in four separate categories. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about U.S. Steel, our footprint in Pennsylvania. I'm going to talk a little bit about the company's relationship with the energy sector, which I think will dovetail nicely with the first panel. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about manufacturing in Pennsylvania. And finally, an important issue facing the American steel industry, and that's uh, one of uh, trade and uh, trade violations. Uh, that our industry is facing from some of our foreign competition. So starting with uh, United States Steel, uh, you'll see on the, the, the first slide, uh, there's a map uh, which shows you where our operations are located in the United States uh, and around the world. Uh, we are primarily located in the United States, though we do have a large uh, steel making operation in Europe as well, in Central Europe, in Slovakia. Uh, here in the United States, uh, United States Steel, uh, steel making, we're an integrated steel producer and what that means is we're making steel from raw materials, iron ore, coal, limestone primarily. Uh, it all starts for us up in northeast Minnesota where we operate the largest iron ore mines in the United States. 
Uh, I spent a lot of time up there, you know, working with the government in Minnesota on those facilities, share a lot of the con concerns and issues that Rachel Gleason talked about for coal mining uh, here in Pennsylvania and elsewhere. Um, we also operate major steel uh, mills in the Midwest and here in Pennsylvania. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, the integrated steel making facility is referred to as the Mon Valley Works. Uh, you are sitting in the central part of the Mon Valley. Uh, this is where it all starts for us, and it's, we've been operating in the Mon Valley for over 100 years uh, as a company. Uh, the Mon Valley Works is connected by the Monongahela River, obviously, but also by railroads, power lines, gas lines, and, and roadways themselves. Uh, there are three facilities all interconnected here. Uh, it starts with the Clareton Coke plant, uh, which I want to talk to you a little bit about. Uh, Claritin is the largest byproduct coke plant in the United States. Uh, Rachel shared some figures with you regarding coal and its relationship to the steel industry. I'll add a little bit to what, what she offered. Uh, U.S. Steel's Claritin plant is a producer of high quality blast furnace coke used by several U.S. Steel facilities, not just here in the uh, Mon Valley. Uh, the coke produced at Claritin is made from a blend of various metallurgical coals, uh, all of which arrive at the plant via barge over the inland water system, which includes the Ohio River and the Monongahela Rivers. Uh, so another key issue for us is maintaining our locks and dam system on the navigable waterways uh, in order to get our coal to the Claritin coke plant. Um, the Claritin plant typically receives about 5 million tons of metallurgical coal by barge each year. Uh, this equates to about 14,000 tons of coal each and every day of the year. Uh, on any given day, the Claritin plant will receive about 8 to 10 barges of coal, which equates to as many as 3,650 barge loads in any given year. Uh, the coke produced at Claritin, as I mentioned, is shipped to other facilities, uh, primarily here in the Mon Valley at our, our Edgar Thompson plant, uh, but also our largest steel mill in Gary, Indiana, as well as our Great Lakes Works, which is located right outside of Detroit, Michigan. Um, these mills consume the coke made at Claritin in the iron and steel making process, producing products that serve customers in the automotive, appliance, container, construction, industrial equipment, and energy industries. Uh, they're all of our customers. Uh, if you look at the next slide, you'll see a photo of our Edgar Thompson plant. Um, so in addition to Claritin, the Mon Valley Works includes our steel production facility, which is the Edgar Thompson plant. This is where we're taking those raw materials from Minnesota and Claritin and elsewhere and, and putting them into our blast furnaces. Uh, we have two blast furnaces at the Edgar Thompson plant. You can see on the following slide some uh, additional photos of what goes on at the ET plant, as we refer to it. Uh, interesting uh, historic note, Edgar Thompson is home to the last two operating blast furnaces in Pennsylvania. Uh, so if you follow the history of the steel industry, that's pretty amazing because this river valley was lined with blast furnaces 40, 50 years ago. There are two left in Pennsylvania. They're both located in Braddock, Pennsylvania at the Edgar Thompson plant. Uh, there are a number of electric furnaces across Pennsylvania, melting scrap producing steel, but making steel through the integrated steel making process from raw materials only occurs in Pennsylvania at the Edgar Thompson plant. Uh, so we're pretty proud of that. Um, in addition, uh, we have a major finishing facility uh, we call the Irvin plant, which is all, also located uh, very close to where we are in West Mifflin, PA. Uh, I should have known the Edgar Thompson plant's literally right across the river from where we're sitting right now. Go across the Rankin Bridge, you'll see it right off to your right. Um, so these facilities combined with our galvanizing line. We have a galvanizing line out in Fairless Hills in Bucks County, which we include as part of the Mon Valley Works. We send some of our finished product out there. It's run through the galvanizing line and, and sold to customers on the East Coast. Those facilities combined with our headquarters, this research center, uh, represents U.S. Steel's footprint in Pennsylvania. Uh, the Mon Valley Works employs about 3,000 steel workers. Uh, when you include our headquarters, research, logistics, Total, we're roughly about 4,000 employees right now in Pennsylvania uh, working every day. The relationship between energy and steel was talked about on the previous panel. I want to talk a little bit more about that because it is really important. Uh, energy is a critical component of our operating process. 
For example, the Mon Valley Works, uh, primarily the Edgar Thompson plant, consumes about 20 million cubic feet of natural gas every day. Uh, it's a very large, one of the largest natural gas consumers in Pennsylvania, other than some of the utility companies that are generating electricity. Uh, we are also, however, one of the state's largest consumers uh, of electricity. Um, interesting note, the Mon Valley Works was uh, certified a number of years ago by the PUC and DEP as an alternative energy system under uh, the state's alternative energy portfolio system, and we qualify for the two tier two credits. Uh, the reason we qualify is because we recycle a lot of our energy. Uh, we drive off gases from our blast furnace and coke operations, generate electricity. We also practice energy conservation efforts and, and reuse a lot of the, the, the waste heat to reheat our furnaces and what have you. So, so we're proud of that. We're proud to qualify for that status. I think we're one of the few large manufacturing sites in Pennsylvania that's a certified under the AEPS. Um, it's critical for manufacturers in Pennsylvania to continue to have affordable long-term energy supplies, including natural gas and competitively priced power rates. Decisions by state government that increase the cost of energy production and electric generation are very harmful to manufacturers uh, for the reasons I just stated. For this reason, our company works closely with the energy sector and state policy leaders like yourself on issues impacting energy resources. Having available and competitively priced energy resources like natural gas and electricity provides our facilities with a key advantage in what's a fiercely competitive global steel market. In addition to being a large customer of the energy sector, uh, we are also a major supplier of steel products. Uh, if you look at the last slide, uh, you'll see some of those products being made at our, our facilities. Um, U.S. Steel, in fact, is the largest producer of steel pipe for the oil and gas industry in the United States. We operate pipe mills in Alabama, Ohio, and Texas. Uh, in addition, a lot of the steel made here at the Mon Valley, what we call hot rolled bands, it's kind of a, uh, a process earlier in the steel making. Uh, those hot rolled bands are used for a lot of steel pipe production as well. We sell to other steel pipe producers. Um, so we are a major supplier to the industry as well as a major consumer of energy as well. Pennsylvania has always been an important manufacturing state. Uh, Pennsylvania remains among probably the leading manufacturing states in our country. Uh, the Pittsburgh region alone uh, ranks manufacturing as the third largest sector in terms of gross regional product at $13.9 billion annually. Manufacturing also employs over 93,000 residents in the Pittsburgh region. Uh, for this reason alone, it would be important for policy leaders like yourself to support manufacturing. However, there are additional reasons. We all know that manufacturing is important to the country. It impacts our lives. It can lift families up, open doors to prosperity, and raise the standard of living. Uh, in order to foster growth and innovation in the manufacturing sector, leaders in state and federal government should work closely with manufacturers and energy companies to develop policies to remove barriers and create incentives for manufacturing to invest and create further job uh, creation. Here in Pennsylvania, we are truly fortunate to have a strong manufacturing base and be sitting on top of the Marcellus Shale, one of the largest natural gas plays in the world. The opportunities to develop our energy and manufacturing sectors are now before us. The role of state government will be important to ensure our businesses are not deterred from taking advantage of this opportunity through overregulation and taxation. Likewise, environmental regulation must be reasonable and based on modern science. U.S. Steel and our employees have a strong commitment to our environment. It's critical that we continue, however, to maintain the proper balance of environmental responsibility and economic, economic opportunity and not risk the future of our remaining manufacturing jobs. If I may, I'd like to spend the last few minutes uh, of my remarks talking to you about what arguably may be the single biggest challenge facing the American steel industry. Most of us are aware of the important historical contributions the steel industry has made to the country. The steel industry played a critical role in building and defending our great nation for more than 115 years. Throughout its history, and even more so than ever today, steel has been an amazing material. It's literally the foundation upon which modern societies build and evolve. It makes our lives safer, easier, and better. 
In the 19th century, the shift from iron to steel ushered in the Industrial Revolution. Uh, much of those steel products were made right here in the Mon Valley where we're sitting today. Steel was that revolution's engine of growth. Today's steel production remains essential to building and maintaining a modern society. There are tremendous opportunities for newly invigorated growth, and there is a newfound enthusiasm for American manufacturing that includes American steel production. Our nation's critical infrastructure and energy independence depends on steel. This includes everything from our roads and bridges to the pipelines that extract and deliver our oil and natural gas, as well as our water supply. Steel also remains a core component in building and construction, and much of the equipment on today's construction sites is made of steel. Steel is needed for all of these things. Our company firmly believes that having the ability to manufacture steel here in the United States is critical for our nation's future economic and national security. Unfortunately, the United States has long been a target for countries seeking to manipulate the global economy to their benefit. And the steel industry is a microcosm of the damage that's resulted from those behaviors. Some countries claim they are merely trying to be more competitive in the global marketplace. In reality, they are ignoring the single most basic principle, supply and demand, and ignoring laws designed to ensure trade is both free and fair for all parties involved. The result, significant industrial overcapacity that distorts and disrupts the global marketplace. In the case of the American steel industry, we've spent decades fighting for the rule of law to be applied. Unfortunately, we saw it erode slowly over a long period of time while we were forced to compete with government-sponsored steelmakers in other countries. They rarely, if ever, must worry about environmental laws, labor and safety standards, or even market forces, but we do every day. Let me offer you just one stark statistic. In 2000, China produced approximately 14% of the world's steel, slightly more than the U.S. production of 11% at that time. By 2015, China accounted for more than 49% of the world's steel production, almost as much as the rest of the world combined. Today, the nation's steel industry is at a crossroads as we continue to experience an alarming rate of unfairly priced foreign steel imports from China and other countries. Unfairly traded steel imports have reached historic levels in 2015 and 2016, taking almost 30% of the domestic steel market. If not addressed by our government leadership, the future of the American steel industry will be placed in grave jeopardy. Fortunately, efforts are underway to address the problem. President Trump, through his Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, has initiated an investigation under Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962. We believe that this investigation will result in a positive finding for the American steel industry including confirming the important relationship between American steel production and our country's national security. We anxiously await a decision on the 232 investigation, and we are optimistic that President Trump will do what is needed for the American steel industry and for American steel workers. I appreciate the opportunity to share these remarks with the House Policy Committee this morning, and I'll be happy to answer any questions after the panel's remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Very good. And Jeff, we'll let you finish it out, and then we'll open for questions. Okay. Appreciate this good testimony. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, good morning. My name is Jeff Nobers. I'm the executive director of the Builders Guild of Western Pennsylvania. Uh, for those not familiar with our organization, we're a labor management organization that is dedicated to fostering a cooperative working relationship between our member commercial construction trade unions the general and specialty contractors, developers and owners of projects, as well as our communities. We were founded some, uh, by some very forward-thinking people back in 1999. Uh, they realized that the path to a sustainable, successful and growing industry was going to be through cooperation as opposed to discord. Today our members consist of 16 construction trade unions and seven contractor associations who work cooperatively on issues of concern to our industry to deliver the best possible quality product to our customers on or below budget and on or before the delivery date. And most importantly, who together 
provide the funding for the joint apprenticeship training centers in the 33 counties of western Pennsylvania, including 16 that operate here in southwestern Pennsylvania. These programs offer our residents, regardless of skill level, gender, or race, the opportunity to build a highly successful, stable, and family-sustaining career in the commercial construction industry. Now, to give you a sense of the opportunities in the construction trades today, please consider this. The commercial construction industry in western Pennsylvania, especially here in the southwest corner, there's no other way to say it. It's just absolutely booming. Uh, there are tradesmen that I work with every day who are in their 50s. They've been doing this for 30 and 35 years. And to a person, they say, I have never, ever seen a market demand like we have now. And it's really just the beginning of what we're going to see. According to the Tall Timber Group, which publishes Breaking Ground magazine, commercial construction for the Southwest region in 2018 is estimated at $5.5 billion. And that was before the announcements made a few weeks ago by UPMC and Highmark about $3 billion in new hospital construction over the next four years. Add to this the billion dollars plus airport, Pittsburgh International Airport project, the Southern Beltway, which has been discussed, the Mon Valley Expressway, condominium, hotel, apartment building, mixed use projects, headquarters for Argo and SAP that have been announced in Pittsburgh and the continuing build out of many of our universities. And we are on the cusp of the building boom that will make any in the past in this region pale in comparison. And all this is going on, and I haven't even mentioned a lot of what we discussed today, cracker plants, uh, manufacturing facility build outs downstream, uh, the shale gas industry, and the burgeoning petrochemical industry. So today among our 16 construction trade unions, employment is at 100 uh, percent in all but a few instances, that being notably the electricians and the insulators, and they're well over 90 percent. Uh, and, and they see their work ramping up as we move forward on some of the projects. Clearly this is all good news for our region and provides the economic basis to help untold thousands of people build a long-term, sustainable, middle-class career and lifestyle for themselves and their family. Yet the challenge for the commercial construction industry in our region is going to be this. Where do we get enough people with the desire to succeed and to build this promising future for themselves, their families, and our region? Our joint apprenticeship training centers right now accept more than 1,200 people every year. We're helping them to develop both the hard and soft skills necessary for a successful, well-compensated career in construction. Our training centers are now taking in record or near record numbers of apprentices as we balance and meet the needs of both an historic construction boom in our region and the impending retirement of some 17,000 of our members between 2022 and 2025. Now, in that our training programs run from three to five years in length, depending on the trade, it's imperative that we continue to attract as many interested and qualified candidates as possible into these programs to both replace those who will be retiring and, of course, to add the numbers that are going to be necessary to meet the demands of this region. Unlike colleges or for-profit trade schools, the training we offer is 100 percent tuition free. There is no cost to the apprentice. Our unions and contractors pay for this to the tune of about $10,000 per year per apprentice, or roughly $30 million annually. The apprentices are also paid while they're on the job. That's roughly 90% of their training is hands-on on the job. They also receive comprehensive health care coverage and pension and annuity plans that are covered through hourly work contributions by our contractors. And you can be 18 years old and be getting all this, you know, right out of high school. It's not at all uncommon for a first-year apprentice, and that would be your entry-level person, to earn $40,000 or more plus those benefits. And their earning potential is going to increase each year as they complete the apprenticeship program, and that's by contract. That's negotiated between the unions and the contractors so that everyone, male, female, African-American, Hispanic, white, it doesn't matter, is going to earn the same hourly rate and receive the same benefits. 
so truly an industry that has equal pay and benefits for equal work. Long term, our members easily earn wages that would qualify them to be in the upper middle class and even lower upper class economic strata. The best part is you don't have to have any experience. You know, as we talked about in some of the manufacturing uh, sectors, they're looking for that experience before people come in. Uh, quite honestly, we prefer you don't have any experience because it's easier to train you if you don't already have bad habits. Uh, on average, a journeyman, uh, those who have completed that apprentice program, earn $65,000 a year plus benefits. You know, by comparison, our state's household, average household income in 2015 was just about $56,000. Uh, the median household income, a little over $53,200. Uh, so you can see the people in the construction trades are earning well above not only the average household income, but the median household, and that's just the singular person, so that's not even accounting for a household income. It's not uncommon, though, for people to earn ninety dollars to $100,000 a year or more, and as demand continues for their skills, knowledge, and dedication as professionals, we have no doubt that those earning levels are going to increase. And these apprenticeships are here right now. Uh, they're not here three years from now. Uh, not if a company decides they want to locate a facility or a headquarters here. Uh, these are here today, and they're going to continue to be here year after year as we move forward for many years to come. So the question really becomes, where do we need assistance in the construction trades? And, and I would concur with what much of the testimony has been uh, in respect to regulation and permitting and things of that nature. Uh, but if there is one area where we truly need some assistance, and, and not just the construction trades, I think anyone that's involved in trying to develop and educate a workforce is a policy or change in policy that would permit the use of state workforce development funds for public education and awareness of these opportunities for people. You know, at the Builders Guild, we utilize social media, we utilize media relations, uh, literally attend well over 100 career fairs every year between uh, neighborhood um, programs, high school programs, CTCs, middle schools, elementary schools. But even with all of that, we're certainly not drawing in the number of people we really need to draw in uh, to meet what these demands are going to be. What's really needed is a coordinated, ongoing public education campaign. Because we have to reach not just those people that may come in, we have to reach the influencers to them the teachers, the parents, uh, the boss they have at the minimum wage job they're in who wants them to progress and be able to move on. You know, the people that are gonna give them advice that they may listen to. Uh, and we just don't have the budget for this, nor do we have the staff for it, quite frankly. Uh, you know, we all have a budget constraint at some point, uh, no matter how big that budget may be. And as I've inquired about this funding, uh, with a lot of the local workforce investment boards, I'm told that it can only be used for training. Uh, well, my viewpoint is we're doing the training and we're funding the training. Uh, where we need the help is getting people to take advantage of what we're already offering. And, and again, remembering that no skills are necessary. Uh, no background is necessary in construction. So that gives us the opportunity to bring in a great many people that otherwise might not get that opportunity. That's really the gist of where our issue is right now, is bringing these people in. So I thank you for allowing me the time today to offer this testimony to you and certainly uh, will attempt to answer any questions you may have. All right, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. We are gonna move into questions. Uh, Representative Nelson, you're first on the list. Thank you, and thank you all for your testimony. Um, my first question, and then we'll circle back through, is, um, is more both a, a question and then a, a potential shared uh, frustration you know, with um, uh, Petra and Catalyst Connection. Um, excellent organization that's doing a really, you know, a, a fine job. There's, there's an impression that we have in Westmoreland County that some of these programs, Catalyst Connection, Innovation Works, are primarily supporting Allegheny County-based 
businesses and our small and mid-sized manufacturers are not being able to um, take advantage of those. And, and oftentimes, as I'm listening to those manufacturers, it may be that, that we're not following the pros proper steps. You know, formally, I have requested a graphic of Innovation Works distribution in grant dollars to Allegheny County as to compared to the surrounding counties. I haven't received that yet over a number of months. And I know you're a different organization, but how can our businesses better connect so that we can take advantage of that? Yeah, and I'd, um, thank you for that, and I I'm, I'm certainly share your uh, concern because, like many organizations, we are resource constrained, but I'm certainly happy to share with you a list of uh, you know, manufacturers that have engaged, that are actively involved. Uh, I can tell you there are a number of them, and Westmoreland County has excellent manufacturers that do take advantage of the programs that are available to them. Uh, so, it, you know, we are happy to meet with and talk to any company that will talk to us. Uh, so please just have them reach out to us and we will we will be following up with them immediately Well, that will be wonderful. Maybe yeah. even as we set goals for 2018 mm -hmm. to do a, a chamber or an SMC yeah, Kind of combination mm -hmm. so that we can better educate our employers to yes. maximize on what you're doing yeah, Thank we, you in you know, like I said uh, the middle school video contest that I talked about there are a number of middle schools in uh, Westmoreland County that participate, and last year Franklin Regional was the big winner, so <laughs> uh, they uh, partnered with Parker Hannafin. So I encourage you to go look at their video, it's really good. Representative James. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <laughs> sorry, couldn't help. Um, similar question to what I asked the last uh, well, not the whole panel, actually, Mr. Smith, but I'll address this to your panel. Uh, and I think Jeff articulated this very well about the required coordination with kids coming out of high school. And I'm assuming you want high school graduates, right, school at, at a minimum. Uh, the average age of an apprentice is actually about 26. Okay, so isn't it a good idea to sit down with Matt Smith and, and actually develop, and maybe this is a good one for Petra to develop a plan that can be given to high school guidance counselors and high schools, principals and that sort of thing, well actually middle school as well, to, to start getting kids to think about supporting themselves. Mom and dad don't have to do this for the rest of their lives. But it's very rewarding. There's nothing like a good job to make you feel good. You, you go home, you support your family. Um, you know, I'm all about this too, as you can tell. It's the same question all over again. Uh, I'd be pleased to listen to anybody's response to that. Well, I, I think from uh, you know that that perspective, and I've met with a lot of the school districts in especially southwestern Pennsylvania, Butler, South Fayette, uh, Armstrong, to name a few, and uh, you know, as part of this whole planning of that. Uh, career curriculum uh, that, that, that the districts have to put together now and you know the one question that comes up is well what do we need to teach these kids I, I don't know that it's so much that it's not there it's it's how you're teaching it and explaining the application of why that's important I mean I'm sure we can all think back to high school and you were sitting in some class and you sat there and said, I'm never gonna use this, why do I have to pay attention to this? Um, well, and you know, I talk to kids now that are seniors in high school and they wanna be a carpenter. And I ask them how they did math. Oh, I, I'm terrible at math. Well, you better go get tutored if you wanna be a carpenter because if you don't know algebra and calculus, you're probably not gonna pass the entry exam. Uh, so it's, it's not that the curriculum isn't there, but, but I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. It's, it's changing the uh, perception and mentality of the teachers and the counselors that you know, they have to say to these kids, look, you don't have to go to college to, and kids always acquiesce to the money, right? You don't have to go to college to make 85 or $90,000 a year. You can go into a trade but you better know math and you better have good reading comprehension skills because they're gonna give you a test and if you don't pass it, you won't get in. 
And, and not only that, you won't have 150000 in debt coming out of college. I mean, that swing in four years as an apprentice can easily be three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars for people between what they don't owe and what they earn uh, during the course of that apprenticeship. And I think that's where the you know a lot of people want to blame the parents, saying that the parents want them to go to college, go to college, and you know maybe they do, but these teachers and counselors have a big influence on the parents as well. And and I think as college costs keep escalating. More and more parents are starting to say, you know, maybe there's a different way we can approach this and, and you know, help our children move forward and progress and have a good career. Yeah, I'd like to um, just comment on that. I think the thing that um, organizations like ours sitting here at the table can do is provide workplace learning opportunities. And this is really rooted in research as well, uh, where, you know, we need to get kids out of the classroom into age-appropriate experiences. So at middle school, it might simply be, you know, a plant tour, a manufacturing day is every year where students come visit manufacturing companies, visiting their local Votech school, just seeing what's out there outside of the classroom. Uh, the video uh, contest, like I said, was just a perfect solution to that because it's, a, it's something that can be scaled. You can take 200 kids and literally 200,000 people can then watch their videos because it's all online. So it's a very scalable model. Employers like U.S. Steel, we rely on employers to provide those workplace learning opportunities. So it, you know, I'm sure it can be, um, you know, it, it takes resources for a company to do that, but we have companies that are willing and able to do that, and I think that's the role we can play to facilitate that interaction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just to add to that, in high school and in middle school, teaching kids how to learn, not just memorizing facts, would be very helpful. I'm done. Thank you, and Jeff, I apologize. I had to step out and uh, appreciate your final <coughs> finishing your testimony on that. I actually have a couple of questions myself. Um, one kind of parlays off that I was curious of whether or not we feel there's enough adequately educated kids coming into the workforce, and I say kids, teenagers, young adults. Uh, two, I really like that expression, age-appropriate experiences, because, you know, for a lot of us, we have a very narrow focus on what were career opportunities. Either we're echoing what our parents did or we're aware of maybe an industry nearby us. A lot of us don't have that in our local areas, but I somewhat joke and uh, sadly that I had to go into legislature to understand what the nanotechnology lab was right there in my backyard at Penn State University. But, you know, I didn't even know it was there and went on a tour. And But how is a high school person supposed to have those um, our knowledge of those types of career opportunities, much less what's going on in the trades. Things are being built around them all the time. So the question, obviously, is we often hear about the underemployed, uh, unemployment rates. It, it bothers me. Are those individuals not looking for work? Are they choosing not to look for work? Or is it because they don't have the skills to be there? Any one of the three of you want to address that, I'd be interested. Um. Coincidentally, uh, this morning I was at the Pittsburgh Regional Alliance, so Matt was here, I was at his office, um, and uh, the number that was put out, our unemployment rate is 4.8%, which is essentially full employment, but the estimate was that there are 38,000 individuals that could be in the workforce but are not, and of course there are varying reasons for that, but um, you know, I, again, I point to the Brookings Institution report where it, it said awareness was a major problem. It isn't that there aren't people to fill training programs. There are lots of training programs out there, but uh, they're just so far removed from this innovation economy that we've built here in our community that they have no idea what's available to them. And I think, you know, a lot of things, uh, the blocking and tackling that Jeff is doing, that we're trying to do, that others are doing to provide that awareness, um, is critical. I think it's one person at a time, unfortunately. And I think another, uh, you know, this is a small example of some of the issues we face, especially, uh, honestly, in minority recruitment, uh, is you have a great many candidates that come forward to us who do not have a driver's license. And mm. a lot of people don't like to accept the fact that they must have a driver's license to have a career in the trades. 
uh, A, you have to get to the training centers, which are not located in downtown Pittsburgh in one office building. Uh, and then most importantly, you have to be able to get to wherever the job sites are. You can't live in the Hill District of Pittsburgh and work at the Cracker Plant in Potter Township without having a vehicle to get there. Uh, so that's a big bugaboo we face. And, uh, you know, Representative Wheatley, I believe, and uh, Representative Sacone have both introduced legislation relative to an amnesty on uh, suspended licenses and so forth, which uh, I, I testified at, at, at that hearing here a few weeks ago. I mean, that's one thing that I think removes a barrier uh, that in some respects is somewhat artificial for some people. But, but I think the bigger issue is uh, it's not a lack of of intelligence, it's a lack of desire, is, is what we see with a lot of people. Uh, you know, when you apply to an apprenticeship program in any of our trades, uh, you do your application, you take a test, if you score appropriately on that test, you're brought back for an interview. And that's where people fall out, is that interview. Because all we're looking for someone to tell us is they're truly committed to this and truly have a desire because we're going to invest tens of thousands of dollars in them. Uh, this is like 16 colleges offering free scholarships. You're not going to take just anybody that comes along. You know, they have to bring something to the party as well in, in order to gain access to that program. And I don't know how you overcome that with people. Uh, you know, we get a lot of good people into the trades. We work with programs that are pre-apprenticeship programs to teach them hard and soft skills to prepare them to take the test so they can pass and get into the program and pass through the interview. Uh, but when you, you know, you can only do that with maybe 30 or 40 people at any given time. You just don't have the, the ability to do that for hundreds of people at a time. So that to me is the big, one of the bigger issues we face is that whole desire thing and I don't know how you solve that problem, quite frankly. Well, we, we used to call that hungry in sports. You know, are you hungry? Are you hungry for the win? Are you hungry to, and, and I feel the same way regarding jobs. I, first of all, am enthusiastic about working. I like work. I've been working since I was 11. But, you know, how do we get that desire to fundamentally want to learn to make something? When I speak in schools, one of the things I try to encourage young people is learn to make something. I don't care if you just build a box. You know, learn to manufacture something, know how something is made. And I worry that sometimes the push to go to electronics and computerization has entertained them at a different level that has taken away from that desire. But fundamentally, somebody had to build that computer. And the whole concept of how that's files on top of files on top of files, you would think would stimulate that. But I want to stay on this topic real quick with one last question on that. Uh, as a policymaker, do you think that our generosity in our welfare system is becoming a deterrent for some of these 38,000 who could be employed but are not employed? And I'm not making that specific to your region, but this is a common thing we hear across the Commonwealth, that we don't have enough workers, we don't have enough that are trained, we don't have enough of the soft skills, and we just don't see the hunger and the desire. I worry as policymakers, considering Pennsylvania is more generous than most states. We have tremendous amount of waivers in the majority of our counties away from the federal standards of who qualifies and who doesn't and when you should be going back to work. Do you see that as a deterrent? Why should I go get dirty? Why should I have to sweat? Why should I have to get up early and drive somewhere if I'm going to make a certain amount of money by the government sending me a check? Well, I, I think at some levels it is a deterrent. Um, I don't know that it's so much for what we offer, uh, because the reality is you really have to have that, uh, if you don't have the drive to pursue the $20,000 a year job, you're not going to have the drive to go up and, and get up at 5 o'clock every morning and drive for an hour and 10 minutes to work, and then work for maybe 10 or 12 hours, because there is a lot of overtime involved in construction, you know, and then get back home at 8.30 or 9 at night. and do it all over again. Now you're going to make great money at it, uh, but that still takes a lot of commitment to do it. Um, so I'm sure at some level that impacts that. Uh, I guess in my mind, I, I sit there and think, you know, why would I want to be getting X 
when I could go out and make this. Uh, <laughs> you know, that just doesn't you know, process for me a lot, but uh, I'm sure it has an impact at some level. Okay, uh, one last question. This is for Chris. Uh, this is for my own knowledge. You talked about the 500 tons of, uh, I think it's material that you're moving by barges. I'm curious, for those of us who live in rural areas and are worried about our roads and things, how, what's the mathematics of that as far as keeping trucks off the roads? You know, because I look at it also from a safety perspective, a maintenance perspective. You know, those barges are a pretty safe way of moving that. That's a massive amount of material. That's got to correlate to a tremendous amount of traffic not on your highways and roads here. Right. Yeah, I, I think I reference 14,000 tons of coal each and every day of the year uh, by barge. Um, I don't know how that equates to the number of trucks, but I can share a story with you uh, that's right on point. We had a lot of flooding six, seven, eight years ago. You know, one of my colleagues is here from procurement who is probably aware of this. Um, and one of the barges uh, capsized at one of the locks and it stopped river traffic on the Ohio River. Uh, and we were unable to bring coal by barge to Clariton. So we, we developed a plan to continue to operate because you can't shut down the coke ovens, you gotta run. And we brought it in by truck primarily and it was very difficult, a lot of truck traffic, uh, bad for the roads, bad for the environment, expensive for us, very difficult situation, couldn't bring in enough fast enough to run at the levels we needed to run. So the river system's critical, and, and it is a very environmentally responsible way mm -hmm. to deliver large quantities of products like coal. Um, so it's critical. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and when we had that problem, it was a big problem uh, for the coke plant and the rest of the Mon Valley Works. Thank you. I believe our host, Representative Ortitai, has a question or two, and then we will close out. Just one, and I'll keep it brief. Uh, Chris, if, if we add, every day I think the governor wakes up, he dreams of having a severance tax. Can you tell me how that would affect U.S. Steel? Well, it depends. Um, the the amount of natural gas we purchase is significant you you, you heard my testimony um, I have not calculated the impact uh, that our supplier would pass on to us uh, from a cost standpoint but I can't comment on the gross receipts tax uh, because I did calculate that because that was seriously being considered and just the gross receipts tax increase on natural gas consumption I think it was about 6.5 percent being recommended that would have been anywhere, depending on price, three to $4 million a year increase in our cost. Um, I'm sure a severance tax would be harmful. Uh, we'd be less competitive. And uh, interestingly, we are looking at some opportunities where we may be able to secure our own natural gas. So. And you guys wouldn't just absorb the cost, you'd pass it on to your customers as well. <laughs> it's not always that easy in the steel industry. Uh, I, I wish we could say that, but no, it ends up uh, probably impacting our bottom line. Uh, it makes us less competitive uh, in a steel industry globally that's fiercely competitive today. And that's internationally. Representative Walsh, then Representative Nelson. Uh, yes, this is more uh, for uh, Petra and, and Jeff. Um, in your outreach uh, efforts toward uh, school districts, um, I guess I'd like to know, in your opinion, do you find them uh, to be very receptive to your efforts or more uh, resistant. And I guess the reason for my question is because I always hear from various uh, school districts touting their, um, you know, average SAT scores and college admissions and college graduates, but I don't hear, you know, they're touting their numbers for entering uh, either manufacturing jobs or, or uh, apprentice uh, programs. So uh, can you give me an idea as to uh, how yeah, you find that? We have found them to be very, very receptive. In fact, uh, we probably have more uh, school districts interested in participating in a variety of programs than, than we can even handle. So, I th and I've seen a big change in that actually over the, you know, I don't know, last five to 10 years on that. Uh, I would agree with that. I mean, the reality is uh, you can't, it's hard for us to keep up with every opportunity we would have especially when you're covering 33 counties and 
in, in the focus on the 12 counties in this region. Um, you know, to the point of pushing the SAT scores in the college, uh, you know, the, they push college and they'll say 85% went on to college. What they don't tell you is 60% of them dropped out after the first year of college. And why did they do that? Because they either really didn't want to go in the first place or they really weren't prepared for it. I mean, I mean it's one or the other because, you know, just having good grades and a good SAT doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do well in college because there's a lot of other factors that come in. Um, and I think that's part of the problem why uh, the trades and other, you know, manufacturing, other, uh, you know, skilled types of jobs that don't require that college degree uh, don't get the attention they deserve because the districts don't report them. They're not held accountable for, uh, you know, the 60% went to college and that's great. Well, what happened to the other 40% of the kids? You know, tell us about, you know, the 10% that went into construction trades, the 10% that went into manufacturing, the 10% that went into computer programming, many of which probably don't, or don't require a four-year degree. Uh, you know, and, and to that, Harvard and Georgetown and you name any university that studied this, I mean, the numbers vary a bit, but by and large what they're saying is we move forward here going to 2020 and beyond, 57 to 60 percent of jobs will not require a four-year college degree. They'll require two-year certification, technical degrees, uh, 30 percent will require college and 10 will be unskilled. And, and that's where the economy is going, yet we still continue to push that old model. Uh, thank you very much. And as a, uh, uh, a guy with three young children, I, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first part of this is just a, a testimony to the reality of your um, story, Jeff. And, you know, as a, as a dad and a, and a father who's at the age of seeing kids graduate, you know, firsthand 19 year olds that have got on both um, with the operating engineers and the pipe fitters that are working hard, requiring them to go to bed early and wake up. So once they start realizing and making the money, I mean, it's, it's true that, you know, that cycle, whether it's someone my age that is busy in the, in the trades, you know, when they're bringing home those big dollars, they're residing their house, they're buying new windows, they're putting in a swimming pool. All of that is invested and reinvested in the economy. And um, your story is very much true. You know, in building, um, Chris, on what you had shared about the blast furnace, you know, I've been fortunate as a subcontractor to work on those blast furnaces and on those bops. And I, I know you had mentioned the thousands of U.S. Steel employees, but all of my work at all of those types of facilities as, as a subcontractor and the hundreds of subcontractors that are brought in in addition to the U.S. Steel employees to be able to do that work, um, our work only hinges on the reinvestment decisions that U.S. Steel chooses to make by um, upgrading or continuing to renew those processes. Can you map out in layman's terms how the net operating loss impacts your investment decisions. Because, I mean, we don't work unless you reinvest, and that reinvestment net operating loss is very glossy. You know, sure. it's, it's hard for people to grasp. Sure. Uh, Representative Nelson, I'll, I'll be glad to do that. I'll keep it at a simple level because that's the only way I could probably explain it. Um, the, to your earlier point, though, I just want to recognize Jeff and his organization. We do employ a lot of building trades and contractors, and they do an outstanding job. We have a master agreement with the building trades, and, and they do an outstanding job working uh, with U.S. Steel. The net operating loss carry forward uh, is probably our most important uh, tax item uh, from a public policy standpoint. And I want to thank uh, the House for continuing to improve uh, that tax policy um, here in Pennsylvania. When you're a cyclical company like U.S. Steel and many others, I mean, you have some years where you're making money and you have other years when you're losing money. In our case, those are probably pretty significant trends, troughs, uh, that we go through. Uh, I think just about in every other state except Pennsylvania, and I think New Hampshire also might be the only other state, 
uh, you are not allowed to carry forward those losses to offset uh, your, your profitable years from a taxable income standpoint. Uh, so even the federal government allows NOL carry forwards, uh, but not Pennsylvania. So in essence, uh, we're not only paying a high CNI tax rate, but we are not allowed to use what every other state in the country and the federal government use, a net operating loss carry forward to reduce our taxable income in those years where we happen to make money. So it's a significant problem for us. Uh, it makes our, our tax rate in Pennsylvania actually higher than 9.9. .9. So we, uh, we would love to see continued improvement. Uh, we understand the budget process is difficult uh, from a revenue standpoint, but you know, Pennsylvania really needs to eliminate the cap on the net operating loss carry forward and be competitive with other states. It's bad enough we have the highest CNI rate in the country, but we also are one of only two states competing with New Hampshire uh, that does not allow uh, the offset from the NOL carry forward. So that's something, and it's not just big cyclical manufacturers, even smaller startup companies uh, are, are very concerned about this because usually, as you well know, when you start a small business, your first couple of years you're going to have a few losses. You hope to carry forward those losses to offset um, uh, those years that you're profitable. And there was a recent uh, Supreme Court decision, as you well know, the Nextel case, which eliminated the smaller uh, NOL carry forward, the hard numbers. I think it was 3.5 million. Uh, someone's here that can help me with that. Uh, so now those companies have to carry forward a percentage. Uh, which I think it's up to 35% now. So the small uh, startup companies are also going to be hit even harder uh, by Pennsylvania's current tax policy on the NOL carry forward. Mm -hmm. When I, I see that um, if Vermont is indeed the only other state that doesn't Vermont. have that, um, yeah. you don't have a facility in <laughs> Vermont. <laughs> I don't <laughs> but think they're a big manufacturer. Uh, you yeah. do have facilities in, in, you know, estimated not just globally, but probably eight other states, you know, in the United States, maybe maybe even more. Yes. So if you are not able to recapture those losses and you know in your five or ten year plan for where whether you're going to invest in Gary Works or you're going to invest in the Mon Valley, right. um, is like how much does that impact on those high level decisions? Sure. You know? Sure. It does impact. And it goes back to what Dave Spiegelmeyer was uh, talking about even with the energy industry companies are going to invest capital where they have their best return. Uh, so there are a number of factors that come into play. You know, your customer base might be one, uh, but there are state government regulatory factors, you know, environmental regulations, taxation, uh, to, name, to just name a few. The tax policy is significant. Uh, tax policy is a significant factor that companies consider when they're going to invest capital. Uh, and it's not just building new facilities, it's investing in existing facilities which would be the case for a company like U.S. Steel. Thank you very much. This has all been very, very helpful. Uh, everyone else good? Uh, Petra, thank you very much. You led off the crew very well. Jeff, very helpful. As a gentleman with construction background myself, I'm, people often say, what are you going to do if you don't get elected? I say, well, fortunately, I can always fall back on that, and I still enjoy that because I enjoy producing something. And Chris, uh, we appreciate what your industry is doing. The fact that you were gracious enough to host us here, we're very, very grateful for that. Uh, just for your knowledge, we are actually, as a policy committee, we've asked for a tax study to be done of Pennsylvania's overall tax structure that's being done currently by the Tax Foundation uh, with hopes and guidance and some actually some information from a young lady here in our audience who has been at some other meetings we've had trying to see how we can make Pennsylvania more competitive. Uh, nationwide, not just with our neighboring states. So we're looking forward to that coming forth uh, beginning of next year. And you folks are all an intricate part of that. So on behalf of the House Policy Committee, we're very grateful for having you here, having us here and you testifying before us. I do want to thank Renee Deal, who's been a big help putting us together, our audiovisual crew, who always tries to make us look good in spite of ourselves, and to my own staff, Bob and Morgan, who have to deal with me, but are very good at coordinating these events. We realize as policymakers, uh, we don't have all the knowledge, and we depend on you folks in the front line that are dealing with us on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm very fortunate to have some great colleagues here and very bright, and we will take this information back and share it with other members. Seeing no other further questions, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you very much. Have a great day.